Good day, and thank you for joining us today as we present, along with our friends from the Council for Federal Cannabis Regulations, on the issue of cannabis lab testing fraud. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them to the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will only be seen by the presenters. You can find answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. Um, I am Jack Jacobson. I'm advisor at Thompson Coburn, and I'm one of the Council for Federal Cannabis Regulations Advisors. Regulatory and legal barriers to medical cannabis research pose a public health problem. Currently, the United States lacks basic clinical and public health research on the health effects of cannabis use. This means that doctors and patients do not have the information they need to best understand the potential benefits and consequences of cannabis use. This leaves many searching for answers and creates a lot of confusion about what is fact and what is fiction. But our guest today will help us sort through what we know and what we don't know. And now I'd like to introduce my co-host for this series, Sarah Chase. Sarah. Well, thanks, Jack. And I, and I realized when I was writing the show notes, I apparently forgot to leave out the lab testing fraud because today's topic <laughs> is cannabis research separating fact from fiction, um, just so everybody knows. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name's Sarah Chase. I'm the executive director for the Council for Federal Cannabis Regulation. Really excited about today's webinar uh, and this topic because we're joined by a panel of experts to help us better understand viable treatment, option, viable treatment options patient advocacy concerns, and what research still needs to do to be done to ensure public health and safety. So I encourage all of you who are watching and participating today to ask a lot of questions, um, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. But please, as Jack said, please use the Q&A widget to see your questions. There is a chat function too, but please again, use the Q&A widget uh, to submit questions for our guests. Now today, we've got three expert panelists, each joining us today with a unique uh, uh, focus and a unique perspective. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Dr. Susan Weiss. She's the Director, Division of Extramural Research at the National Institute of, on Drug Abuse. And Dr. Weiss, if you could take a moment, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and the important work that you do. Thank you. Um, I've, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I've been National Institute on Drug Abuse for a uh, little over 20 years, um, working in the area of science policy and communication, as well as um, now working in, as the director of the Division of Extramural Research. I worked at an advocacy organization before coming to NIDA, the National Mental Health Association, which is now Mental Health America, and was a researcher at the National Institute on Mental Health before that. Um, our division handles a lot of the main infrastructure needs of the Institute, but we also house two of the large scientific projects that NIH is conducting, which NIDA has a lead on, and which we might get to speak about just a little bit later on, but they're called ABCD and HBCD. These are very large studies that are following a, a group of people um, for about 10 years, the ABCD study starts in adolescence, starts when kids are about nine years old. We have almost 12,000, and we're following them into adulthood, looking at a number of different measures of development and the impact of drugs and many other factors on development. And we'll be starting a similar study in pregnant women very soon. Um, but I'm here today because I'm also uh, one of the people who is the spoke, who speaks for NIDA on the issue of cannabis. and. I've been doing this since I've been in the science policy office. Um, it's, it's an incredibly interesting area of science and policy. And what I try to do is to be as accurate and as unbiased in my presentations as possible. Um, this is a fraught area and I want to at least try and present the science as best as we understand it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, and for anybody who wants to check out the study, it is abcdstudy.org, and we'll, we'll post a link to it later on. Um, and now it's my pleasure to also introduce Steph Scher. She's the founder and president of Americans for Safe Access, which is a CFCR partner organization. Um, and Steph, we're looking forward to being part of your uni unity conference in December here in DC. Um, Steph, can, tell us, can you tell us just a little bit more about uh, ASA, ASA um, yourself and your focus on patient advocacy? Thank you, and thank you for having me. This is gonna be an exciting conversation. 
Um, yet I am the founder and um, now president of Americans for Safe Access. Uh, for the last 20 years, we have been uh, moving this concept of medical cannabis forward, um, which has included a lot of different things over the years. Uh, when we started, there was definitely a lot of misinformation to tackle. Now there's new misinformation that we're <laughs> <laughs> constantly tackling. Um, but our advocacy work has, has started with bringing patients from around the country and bringing other stakeholders to the table, like doctors, scientists, um, and uh, people, producers, people in uh, the cannabis marketplace uh, to create this vision of safe access. And so over the years, that's meant bringing attention to federal raids uh, and prosecutions of patients and producers. It's meant creating product safety standards uh, that are now um, internationally adopted. Uh, and we uh, currently certify medical cannabis products uh, for consumers. Uh, we also create um, doctor and patient education, uh, trying to get through some of those myths. Um, and I think the most rewarding and exciting part of what we do is we empower patients to speak for themselves. So over the last 20 years, we have trained um, tens of thousands of patients on how to uh, read and read legislation and understand it, how to read regulations and uh, really advocate for themselves to make sure uh, that they're reflected in, the, in that legislation. And of course, we're still working to change federal law, which we believe would be a, create the creation of an office of medical cannabis. Um, and um, you know, our advocacy has taken us in, to some odd places like rescheduling cannabis at the UN level before we were able to do it here in the United States. Uh, but every everything everything moves uh, this vision forward. And I'm excited to really talk um, to folks in a, about the future and about where we're going. And uh, research is a major part of that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steph. Uh, and now it's my distinct pleasure to also welcome Dr. Jordan Tischler, uh, president of the American Cannabinoid Specialists and also a member of CFCR's medical sub subcommittee. Uh, Dr. Tischler, welcome. And uh, if you could tell your background too as a medical professional. Sure. Um, thank you all for having me on today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, so um, my background is that I'm a physician. Uh, I'm on the faculty at Harvard Medical School and I founded and am president of the Association of Cannabinoid Specialists, which is an organization sort of uh, akin to ASA, uh, but focused on the medical professionals. Our goals are really to um, ensure that regulations are put in place that um, safeguard patients, that provide tools for physicians to take proper care of their patients. Um, and we need to educate more clinicians uh, so we have a large educational component to our activities, uh, and obviously we have to educate uh, lawmakers in the process so that we get that kind of um, regulation that is, in fact, supportive. So it is a real honor to be uh, amongst my esteemed colleagues today. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the guests for being with us today. And uh, to sort of kick off the conversation, um, Jack and I thought that a, a, a good way to start this is to talk about sort of shifting perspectives on cannabis use right now. Um, so there, there is sort of been, I won't, let's say a sea change, but um, I think the, the understanding and the perception of cannabis use has changed. Um, more and more research, um, at least of, of, of a call for that. So what, in your opinions, what can we do to better empower good science to guide good policy at this stage in cannabis research? Uh, I think Jump that's right a really, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a tough question. I mean, we would like good science to guide good policy, but policy is way ahead of the science at this point and really is not able to sort of wait for all of the scientific information to get there. Um, I think that, um, you know, we, we I mean, we'll, I know we'll discuss this more, the sorts of research that we need, but right now we're talking about products that are very different from what was around 20 years ago. They're very diverse. Um, we tend to talk about products that are high in CBD or cannabidiol, which, has, which have very different 
risk profiles to those that are high in THC, which is, which is associated with more of the liabilities of cannabis. So we're talking about a much more complicated issue, and it also you know, reaches into so many different realms around criminal justice, around social equity. And so it's, it's, a, very, um, it's a very complicated area. And I, and I hope that science, as well as other factors, will guide policy as we move along. It doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> I would like to add to that and say, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that's not clearly happening in, in as I see it, is uh, policy, as, as Dr. Weiss says, is um, operating at this point without all of the data that it needs. But at the same time, I think we're making policies that, um, that are making assumptions about cannabis' safety. Um, and rather than saying, look, we're going to err on the side of caution here and then devote resources to getting the appropriate answers, um, there's an awful lot of punting going on, and that punting seems to be driven in large measure uh, by the desires of the industry to sell product as opposed to uh, the desires of patients to be well and safe. And so I, I find that somewhat of a challenge. I, I think that in you know to directly answer some of the question or the question that was asked, I think that the government needs to number one decide that this substance doesn't belong on schedule one which is sort of a hands-off category and number two is we need to start putting a whole lot more money behind the research right right now uh nih which is the primary funder of um non-industry driven um research it it's just not got enough allocated to get to the answers that we need this is not a criticism of NIH or NIDA. It's simply the reality of the situation. And frankly, if there's anybody here on whose door, doorstep this, uh, I'm not happy using the word blame, but for lack of a better one, I will use it. Um, it's Congress. Congress you know, keeps saying the FDA will do this or NIH will do that, and then they don't include funding. So how do we expect that that's anything more than grandstanding? All right, now I'll shut up. No, that was that was good, and I, I would like to just sort of build on that, which is, you know, we we need to decide um, at the federal level if we're going to explore cannabis as a medicine or not, or not. and we have not done that. Um, cannabis is Schedule One, which means there is no recognition. We're now um, outside of the UN Single Treaty, which recognizes uh, the medical use of cannabis. Uh, and uh, until we make that choice, um, you know, the only funding that is, is available is going to be under the mandate of it being illegal. And so we can monitor what's happening, but we're not really answering the questions about how to, you know, how to make a better medicine. That being said, you know, cannabis is a medicine. Uh, we have uh, enough um, uh, proof of that through some pharmaceuticals, but also through thousands of years of use. And so on one hand, what we really need to be looking at is making sure that while cannabis, a plant that people grew in their backyard, um, in their uh, kitchen garden to treat um, ailments is now being mass produced. And I like to say cannabis is safe. Uh, mass production is not inherently safe unless it's un done under safety guidelines. And so those safety guidelines we can't have a consensus that those are being implemented until we all have a consensus this is a medicine and realize that patients are taking these medications um, three to five times a day and they could have contaminants and other items aside from not understanding all of the cannabinoid science. Um, and I think that the only way that we're going to be able to move forward to, uh, to, to increase funding to let agencies even use funding that could be applied to cannabis um, is going to be creating a, a new schedule for cannabis, uh, as well as creating an office of medical cannabis uh, that can actually oversee this um, and help agencies that I know want to work on it. Um, talk to folks at CDC, um, talk to folks at, um, um, at USDA. They all want to have a, a, a better role um, and I think the only way that we can do that is to say, that's what we want to see. Um, because the state experiment is now, we're now on 25 years. Um, and talking to state regulators, they've, they've done a great job. Um, we've kind of made this up in a prohibition space, which is a very odd thing to do. 
uh, with policy and regulations. Uh, so we've learned a lot. Um, I think we could back up on some of the plutonium style regulations um, of cannabis, but um, you know, right now the reality is, is that federal agencies do not have the green light um, to start regulating a medication. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that is that um, at the state level, what we're seeing is the reality is it's much easier to regulate an intoxicant than it is um, a medicine. And what we're actually talking about when we look at medical cannabis is a new pathway of medicine. It doesn't fit into the, the nutraceutical box. It doesn't fit into pharmaceuticals necessarily. And so that means we need to say, let's, let's keep, let's build on the success that we're seeing in the States. Let's not forget the, all the success that we're seeing as far as opioid deaths um, and, and other items from medical cannabis in those States. And let's build on that. I'd like to say, so, I, so Sorry, I, go I, well, go ahead. No, Susan, you go. Um, so I have to sort of agree and disagree with some of the things that you said. I, um, you know, I, I am absolutely in favor of the fact that we do need to have more research to determine what cannabis is good for, what types of cannabis, what, you know, what products, what doses, but I don't think it's, it's established as a medicine broadly. And I think that there is, um, I, I think that there is a confusion when, um, you know, the, the reg I think you're right, that it's a much more difficult product to regulate than most of the other types of pharmaceuticals. But at the same time, the, there aren't, the clinical information is not there for many indications that patients are using it for. And some of the evidence around the opioid deaths, for example, haven't real, hasn't really held up. So I, I think we have to be careful in stating more than we actually know. At the same time, I completely agree with you that there's obviously a lot of potential for therapeutic uses, particularly around pain. We know that CBD products are obviously very good for um, serious epilepsy in children. And I think there's gonna be a much wider array of conditions but I don't think we are at the point yet where we have the data and where we can provide that information accurately to patients. And, and we do owe it to them and we do need to put the money in and do the work to get there. So I'm, I'm completely with you that we need the research to study the medicinal benefits, but I'm not sure we're there yet, at least on many of the different ways it's being used. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jordan. I was just going to say, all right, fine. You know, I think that there is definitely, uh, first of all, anytime anybody says we need more data, I think that's an inarguable answer, right? I mean, that is to say, even in the field of cardiology, where we have many large trials, uh, we're forever finding that what we thought we knew, we didn't. Um, and so more research is always welcome. But at the same time, I think that there are, uh, indications for which cannabis or particularly THC are well established and pain management is one of them. I will also concede that there are other areas, for example, anxiety and depression, where that data are um, less viable. They, they're there, but they're not such quality data. So I, I basically agree, but I don't want to um, undersell the viability of cannabis as a medicine. I also wanted to turn back to the thought that, um, Steph, I think you had said something about um, the states having done a good job with regulation. Um, and I, I think that that could be said for some of the early states that were working, particularly California, for example, under very different- <laughs> Sorry? I did not mean adult use. That is a whole, that, that's no, a whole no, other- No, no, no. Uh, no, no. Um, I, I think my point is this, that what was appropriate sort of loosey-goosey, sure, the doc can make a recommendation, blah, 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 uh, was much more appropriate in 1996 than it is today in 2022. And that at this point, the states that are coming on making regulation around medical cannabis use, that has that same sort of like, yeah, just wave your arms and make a recommendation kind of thing, really defy where we are at this time in terms of the um, importance of and the return to a patient doctor
a relationship in which we really uphold the, um, the doctrine of informed consent. And without um, the informed, the consent becomes meaningless. So I think that right now, as a policy issue, um, these states that sort of want to, or that are promulgating this uh, 1990s era California model where physicians simply say yes or no, and then the patient does, goes out the door to sort of figure it out with the input of, you know, their friends or their cousins or, or um, you know, the bud tender. Uh, that, I think, is now in the realm of malpractice. And I think that physicians need to become educated. So they know what they're doing, acknowledge where it is we don't have the data that we want and be giving patients the kind of um, straightforward and direct recommendations that we would write in a prescription if we had the uh, ability to do so. And in fact, I think that one of the major issues for, for uh, that I've seen with my patients is that not being able to write a prescription leads to a whole raft of downstream harms to patients. Uh, and I think that at the federal level, we really do need to be able to write some sort of a document, call it what you will, that specifies exactly what is to be sold and what amounts and how to use it. And then that the dispensaries need to be you know, bound to dispensing that and nothing else. I would, can I, so can I, can I, I just, if I can, Sarah, is that okay? Um, and that's just that I just want to bring people sort of back to where we are in the evolution of safe access. Uh, and I agree, we're not, what we see right now, uh, as far as the dispensaries, the recommendation, but most importantly, the products and the lack of research for those products is that we're in a compassionate use state, right? And when we began working on this, or when I began working on this issue 20 years ago, I was inspired because my doctor recommended something that was totally crazy to me, which was cannabis. And I may not be having this conversation with you right now um, if that hadn't happened. I was close to losing my kidneys because they're anti-inflammatories. And if I had not, I didn't, even, I, I didn't use cannabis. It never came up in my mind. And so that compassionate use um, was something that we were starting with as a point where people, you know, your doctor says, use this, now go find it. That was a fun experience. Um, and so <laughs> I wanted to find something, a place that was at least safe for patients um, to be able to purchase so we could monitor what was being sold. And that's what I meant by the regulations. That was as good as, as things got. But I think what's unfortunate is a lot of people look around and they think that we've won, that what we were fighting for as medical cannabis patients were, was compassionate use. And that was supposed to be one step to get patients out of alleys and into the light so they could buy safe products and didn't have to worry about getting robbed or these other issues to purchase cannabis and have somebody monitoring it. Um, but it was never my wildest dreams was that supposed to be the end. And with adult use, what we've seen is not only the um, cannabis marketplace focus their resources elsewhere as far as, um, fun, as, far as research goes, um, we've also seen regulators kind of, whew, we don't have to deal with that anymore, right? That, and doctors right. as well. So doctors saying, great, go buy it from there. You don't need me. So I think that where we come back to research um, is that there, there is a lot of amazing observational studies out there. We could, we could travel the earth 10 times around. The issue is that we don't have evidence-based clinical trials. And that I think we have to turn to not just regulators, but a combination of regulators and um, the cannabis market. Um, we can't do evidence-based research and doctors can't do what you're talking about doing until there are products that are standardized. And at Americans for Safe Access, we're actually in the same way we created product safety standards, we're now working on creating uh, standards for products on labeling, how to talk about cannabis quantities and liquid versus these other things so that we can actually give a roadmap to the cannabis market to produce those products so that doctors can write prescriptions so patients can depend on the same thing. And we can do that. What's exciting is that we know that it has enough of a safety profile that we can do that research while patients have access. So that's where com it's, it, you know, we're compassionate use um, meets evidence-based medicine. Um, and I just want to be very clear that patients are not happy with the way things are. Just because there is a, um, a pot shop on every store, the last thing I enjoy doing is talking to a well-bodied young person about the medication they offer. 
and them telling me what they like to use. Um, and my question is, oh, you have dystonia? Oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, so um, how, do, how do you know what I, what I need? So I think that, um, um, that I'm very open to the fact that just because cannabis can work for a lot of things, that it may not necessarily be needed for everything. Um, and I think a lot of patients are. Uh, but I think that we have to be aware and just, you know, open our eyes that people are using cannabis. So a, um, a sort of wait until we see uh, what the research said is not going to work. And that's sort of how we got here in the first place. If there was a medicine that worked for me, I would not have started Americans for Safe Access. Um, and I think that we also need to um, really be open to a new way of creating uh, standardized evidence-based medicines that's not going to quite look like pharma pharmaceuticals and hopefully won't just look like um, the open market. So I, I'm really glad to hear all of those things that you said, because I think those are really problems that we deal with with the current medical cannabis issue, that it's really a hodgepodge and that dispensaries are selling the same products in their adult use components as they are in their medical use component. And really what patients need are exactly what you said. They need to have products that are well labeled, that are well regulated, that are at appropriate levels of THC that will help them with their particular conditions rather than get them high. And we've, we've sort of developed into this country that now has really a mix of all of those things. So I know that there are very serious, there are people like you who are very serious about trying to make this a legitimate medical market. And there are, then there are people, there are physicians who feel exactly the same way. And then, as you said, there are also many people who are, who were at least using this so that they could get cannabis legally to begin with. So we're in, we are, we are in a very kind of complicated and not very helpful way for many patients. And I agree with you. I think we're going to have to have other strategies for getting this evidence based because we don't have time and we're not going to be able to do all of the clinical, the, you know, the randomized clinical trials to get us the information we need in the time period that we need. Well, Dr. Uh, Weiss, you don't have... Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. I'm wondering, Dr. Weiss, can you explain to us um, currently what, what sort of mandate NIDA has in research um, and how are you working with the other agencies? Can you just sort of explain the, the role of, of NIDA here in this conversation? So NIDA and all of the other NIH institutes have an overall mission. Our overall mission is to prevent drug use and prevent mm -hmm. drug addiction and with many consequences. We've been studying marijuana for many years to understand how it works and it's helped us uncover this whole system, the endocannabinoid system, which has, which is involved in many different functions and has the potential for both medical and for um, non-medical and you know problematic um, outcomes, as as we've seen with cannabis. We do study, um, we do put money into um, into studying some of the the medical benefits. We we supported research on the um, anti-pain effects of cannabis. We've also supported research on effects in HIV. And it's by, by understanding these systems that we can try to figure out what might be the best places to, to put that money. But it's not just NIDA. It's all of NIH. So the National Cancer Institute, for example, has now become much more interested in cannabis, both from the standpoint of what their patients are taking and what the outcomes are, as well as whether or not there are potential um, carcinogenic effects, as well as there are potential anti-carcinogenic effects. So I think that the more that other institutes with their specific missions, we have a neurological disease institute which studies epilepsy, for example. So it's really not just a NIDA mission, but it is an NIH mission. But it is, it's still... You know, it's it's still part of our many many different priorities. So we are not focused on cannabis. And right now, as I'm sure you can imagine, the opioid crisis is really taking a lot of our attention and our money. And Steph, I, I don't think I think you had a follow up question that I in interfered on there for you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I was um, I was just going to sort of add um, to what Susan was saying, which is. Um, I think one thing we just learned from uh, the pandemic is that with funding and will, 
um, we can get through a lot of research quickly. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that, um, again, um, unless we see a federal agency come forward or create, you know, being created to focus on this, um, you know, the different perspectives that Susan mentioned from the different agencies is a little different. And we really need a central organizing um, agency um, to help coordinate all this different research so that it can be done quickly. Um, but another thing that happened within the pandemic is, is was that there was funding, but also all of the companies that stepped up um, to make vaccinations knew that there was going to be a long-term economic benefit. Um, and I, I'm, I don't think we can deny that. And I think one of the challenges that we're seeing at the state level um, for companies that are struggling in the medical cannabis space um, is that there aren't incentives for people to produce medical cannabis products. And so what I mean by that is they're, they're, they're having to deal with the same sort of taxation. There isn't um, specific funding. Um, and so I think that you know, with an Office of Medical Cannabis, we could really work with the states to create uh, incentives for uh, people in the cannabis market to want to create standardized products. Um, if they're, a lot of companies are are really um, being dragged into the adult use market just to keep their doors open, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But I think that um, again, if we decide that we see the potential of cannabis and we want to, uh, as a nation, explore it, we we can do that, and we have some very um, recent um, examples of what we can do in this country when we put our heads to it and add, a, and add some funding. Um, we, we've got a bunch of audience questions coming in and, and some of them are related and, and they, they sort of build on a question that, that we've had for everybody, which is what are some of the legal constraints that still prevent a diversity of research project, projects on cannabis right now? So I, I think can... we're... Go ahead, Barbara. I can. I, yeah, I think we're ahead. aware of you know this the schedule one. Uh, the can, having cannabis in schedule one creates a challenge. It's not just for cannabis; it's also for psychedelic drugs, for example, which people are now very interested in. But I think one of the and that so that stops a lot of people from getting into it. I think some of it has to do with um, with the profit motive and whether or not people are going to be able to. That people are not able to patent plant products. So even though um, psychedelics research, for example, is really starting to take off despite it being in schedule one, that didn't happen so much with cannabis. The other really big problem has been that um, the way in which the international um, conventions were interpreted um, was that there could be only a single source of cannabis used for all research. NIDA happened to have the contract that produced that. And that really limited the diversity of products. And NIDA has tried to diversify here the types of products that are available throughout the country. The DEA has recently changed that and has licensed additional manufacturers, but there's only a few. It's, it's still moving very slowly. I hope that if there are additional manufacturers that they will be able to then have different types of products and then they can work on developing them for a whole variety of different indications. But there have been many there have been many aspects of it that have really made it, I think, a struggle for people. We're, we're still not able to study products that are available in the dispensaries. We're not that still because it's federally illegal. We can't actually um, look at what those products are and what they are specifically doing to people. That would have yeah. been a very significant advance. And unfortunately, that provision was just removed from uh, the reconciled defense spending bill. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. But, you know, there's sort of this constant thing in, in this field of sort of looking where we can as opposed to where we should be. Um, and again, you know, if you... Uh, if we get cannabis from, from Mississippi or even from the five new licensees, they're not going to represent what's available to the patients unless those comp those research institutes spawn, you know, essentially a pharmaceutical style company from that research. Ultimately, the question of what is available in the medical as opposed to recreational or, or, or um, pharmaceutical marketplaces is going to be um, hard to research because we're just not, I mean, until we pass some law that says we can research that. 
Yeah, I think, I just and I think to... there's pathways for that. Oh, sorry, Susan, go ahead. I, I just wanted to respond to one of the points in the, the in the Q&A, which I think is really important, that again, we're also talking about a product that is very complex, that we're talking about all of these different cannabinoids that some of which have not yet been identified. We're talking about plant products. We're talking about extracts. We're talking about individual products versus versus full spectrum products. And all of that also adds to the complexity of doing this kind of research. So patients aren't necessarily getting all the information they need to know what exactly they're taking and what the, you know, what the products are and how much of these THC or other things are in them. The products themselves are very complex. So all of this really requires, you know, a lot of thought and a lot of, you know, care and trying to interpret what is good for what and under what circumstances and for whom. Yeah, I would I would just sort of add to what um, Jordan was saying, and, and I agree with everything you just said, Susan. Um, is that you know uh, when our legislation, what we're looking at is under the Office of Medical Cannabis, um, you know the the states that have actually granted licenses for producers and manufacturers uh, would 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 automatically get um, a li a federal license that looks very similar to uh, the DEA license. And of course, um, that would mean um, that their standards um, would be dictated by the businesses that they're selling to. So if a researcher wants to use cannabis that is being produced also for a medical cannabis dispensary, um, you know, they're gonna have to meet whatever those standards are, which they may not be currently meeting in the state. And I think that, um, again, what I've, what I've seen happen is that if, um, if you build a market, um, the marketplace will rise up uh, to create that product. And so if we start seeing uh, everything from consumers to um, manufacturers demanding specific um, uh, standardized products, um, that I really believe that, that the marketplace will, will uh, rise up to meet that. Um, I think also, you know, we can't, we can't really push aside all of the, the additional burdens that these businesses face um, during federal prohibition as well. So with, by, by rescheduling cannabis and creating an office of medical cannabis, those businesses that want to work on medical are not gonna be subject to the 280E tax laws. They're gonna be able to use banks. Um, we're not gonna have to create separate transportation systems for cannabis. We're not gonna have to create separate labs. We're not gonna have to create um, separate banks for cannabis. All of these things that actually take a lot of um, honestly, creativity <laughs> that I would rather see be used towards research. Um, uh, I really believe that if we can, if we create that environment, um, that we will see businesses uh, rise to meet that challenge. Uh, but right now, there just isn't a runway for a lot of that um, or uh, the capital. That's very optimistic. I hope you're right. <laughs> I usually am. Oh, good. <laughs> I have to say, I think that the counter example, of course, is CBD, which is on every street corner and has basically very little in the way of proven efficacy or safety. Um, uh, but industry has responded by making a market in this and convincing people that they want or should be using this in the absence of that kind of data. So I think that you know, I, I agree with you. For creating incentives will hopefully drive companies to do what it is that we think is in the public interest. But at the same time, um, at least current regulation was perhaps ill-conceived and has now led us to a marketplace um, in what could be called snake oil. Well, you're talking about a very, very unregulated market, more unregulated than the medical cannabis programs at this point. No question. question. <laughs> yes. I mean, that the, the real issue in my mind is, you know, um, who thought this was a good idea? And I know the answer to that, but, um, uh, uh, you know, I wish it had not gone that way. Let's put it that way. Well, I think, I think people, we've got to find creative ways to deal with prohibition. And, and there, and I would say that if, if you want to look at sort of what created what, um, you know, we had to be very creative while facing people going to jail for real amounts of time. Um, you know, people spent 20, 30 years in prison for providing patients access. So I think that we, we have to, I know it, it seems like a long time ago, 
Um, but even under the Obama administration, we saw um, dozens of people go to jail and were separated from their families. So I think we can't um, we can't just look at this without seeing all the constraints that have been on patients and have been on those trying to provide. And yes, there is a um, there was an industry as the byproduct of our patient advocacy. I'm I'm quite aware of that. Um, but I'd like to see that uh, air quote industry turn into a marketplace. That can provide a commodity that provide that makes medicine and these other issues. So we're getting some um, audience questions we want to drop in, and one of them is is sort of under the umbrella of what gets studied gets funded, right? And the federal studies have um, historically been about the harm of these products and not the therapeutics or the medical benefits. And so, how does the federal government need to shift um, in an effective manner to studying those therapeutics and benefits from this these host of, of different molecules within this plant. And um, Steph and Jordan, if you could, or Dr. Tishman, if you could weigh in on that. And then Dr. Weiss, if you could just say, I know that might not be in your Bailey Blick, but NIH at large might have some, um, you might have some suggestions on NIH lar at a larger level. Steph? Yeah, so I would, um... I'd say yes, we've seen actually some of the, the strongest research that we've seen over the year had to be, they actually had to pose the research question as a negative um, to get funding to find the positive, right? So we've seen, we've seen that a lot. But again, I think that um, there currently is not a consensus in this country that we should research this. We, it's, um, I mean, if you look at even the projects at, under NIH um, that Susan had mentioned, um, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of a creative, they're sort of insular within that agency instead of looking at a bigger uh, research strategy. Um, and there are some just very basic things that need to get researched. Um, when I've worked with researchers around the globe and they've asked me what I want to see researched, I always say the most boring things you can imagine. I want you to, <laughs> yeah. and because we just, we really need that, those building blocks um, so that we can do the bigger research. And so you can't just do that by saying cancer and $2 million, right? And so what you have, unfortunately, <laughs> is you have, which is, you know, which is what we we're seeing at the state level and, and in some of these programs, that what we really need to say is like, and actually in order for you to research anything, whether you're talking about cancer, uh, inflammation, um, we need to talk, we need to know what we're talking about. So can we just spend uh, six months, a year, and decide how we talk about how uh, milligrams in liquid uh, versus powder versus a pill. Can we just get a consensus on that? So then we don't have every single researcher sitting down, think they're about to get started with their $2 million and realize they have to do another observational study because they didn't ask for funding to figure out standards. So I think that as soon as we create an office of medical cannabis, they're going to create a, um, a research strategy and they're going to say, Somebody, we need we need to have uh, standards for all labs to use. We need to have public methodologies. You have a year. Here's two million dollars, and then that two million dollars for cancer is actually going to get to do something very exciting. And I think oh, that's really the challenge. Zeros to that yeah. number, you got to add a few I, zeros to that number. Yeah, of course, of course. I was just that was my, I was just continuing with my metaphor. I think sure, that we can sure. take the climate, the amount that we just are about to sign for climate, I don't know, $600 billion maybe for medical cannabis research. I'm just kidding. Sorry. I'm not, worried. I'm not working on that bill. <laughs> you know, um, I think that one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that um, definitive research science is very difficult. It takes time and it takes a lot of people and it takes a lot of money. Um, and uh, there was a comment in the in in uh, from the from the audience about um, you know the, that the researchers and the public kind of want different things, um, and that may be true. But I think that the public really does need to remember that much of what they take for granted in our society at the moment is safe. That it is safe, and it's safe because the researchers demanded. Um, the level of evidence that, that we have. Um, similarly, somebody had mentioned we need 
um, you know, to look more at real world data and less at, um, you know, classic scientific methodology. Um, and I think that there's some value in that. And we certainly, as Steph has mentioned, um, seen a whole raft of these observational studies that are good beginnings, but they really don't get down to, they don't have the ability to show us whether things are effective or whether they're safe. And to do that, we really do need things like randomized controlled trials that are very hard to do. Um, and uh, an example of this is I was recently, I am involved with a company and we just did a research trial um, of a particular cannabinoid and I'm running up against my NDA here, so I'm going to try and be vague, but let's put it this way. We had um, a sizable number of patients in this randomized controlled, placebo controlled trial. And what we found was on the topic of anxiety that 71% of the users got benefit from the placebo. And no more people got benefit from the active arm from the cannabinoid than the placebo. So the point is placebo in this case was an enormously astounding effect, large and, and positive effect, but the active arm, the cannabinoid medicine added nothing. Um, and this is why we can't simply say, well, let's just ask everybody whether they think cannabis helps their X, Y, and Z, because they may feel that it does, but it, it might not actually be the cannabis or any particular part of the cannabis. And we need to That's know That's not this. a horrible thing. <laughs> um, I, I'd, I'd like Dr. Weiss to kind of build on that too, if she could talk a little bit more about um, real world That's evidence cool. and some of the difficulties in using it. And maybe um, in talk a little bit about the ABCD study too at the same time and about how that's a sort of good example of how research is done. So I, I think I'm going to hold off on ABCD for now, but I do think this issue around real world evidence, I mean, I'm happy. I love ABCD. I could talk about it forever. But um, I, but um, the, as far as real world evidence goes, I mean, NIDA is also trying now to, um, we've, we have a funding announcement out to try to set up a registry to get more of this information, more of this observational data about how patients are using products, what they're using, and what the, uh, the um, outcomes are. Recognizing that this is still going to be a biased source of information, but at the same time, it will give us clues as to some of the areas that we might not even be aware of that, that patients are seeing benefits in. And at the same time, this idea of having these standards, I mean, we've actually We've actually put out a request for all of our researchers doing work in, in humans to use a, a, a standard unit of five milligrams THC in how they report their results. Again, just to try to sort of get some sort of semblance of comparability from one study to, to another, recognizing that this is not perfect. But this is going to be very hard to do in studies when what you can find in the dispensaries is not, apart from edibles, which are marked in milligrams, you find things based on whatever the product is, is you know, like purple kush, or you, you find all of these products that do not, that do not even from dispensary to dispensary have the same percentages of THC versus CBD. So we need to also be training people. We need to be um, making sure that people can get accurate information, and then we need consumers on, you know, what exactly it is that they're to be able to assess how effective it is. So I think all of those are really important. ABCD is a study in adolescence, and we are trying to measure. Uh, we, try, we, we started at age nine because um, it's 12,000 kids. We started at age nine and 10 before they started using substances. And part of this is so that we can measure once they do start using substances uh, uh, among many, many other things in their world what the outcomes are on brain development, on health, on social development, emotional development. And the study itself is, is all of the data from the study is made widely available to the research community so people can ask all sorts of questions, including whether there's an amount of cannabis that's perfectly safe or helpful to people. So we're, we are, uh, we're just trying to get as much information as we can to look what happens from the start when people are, are using and exposed to many other things in their lives. Susan, I think your points about standardization are really important. I would just wanted to chime in and say that, you know, when I work with my patients, uh, I haven't really talked much about my medical practice in, in, in cannabis medicine, but, um, and I have patients where I think that they will benefit more from inhalation 
first of all, I say inhalation, not smoking. I don't recommend that anybody smoke cannabis. Um, but I have developed my own little protocol where I can standardize what they're getting to about five milligrams. Um, and I think that that's very useful for not only monitoring how the therapy is going, but then in instances where a patient has a medical need to convert from inhalation to oral or vice versa, then there's some ability to say, all right, this is what I need you to you know, do here. And, and that will ex get the expected result, which is, of course, what we really want. We've got a final um, uh, uh, sort of wrap-up question. This has just absolutely flown by. Um, so I apologize if we didn't get to an audience question. But as a wrap-up question um, for each of you, what are the biggest challenges facing cannabis research today and for regulation? And what role can the industry play in helping to speed up research at the federal level and, and privately? You want to start? Dr. Tischler, and then Dr. Weiss, and then Steph? You know, I think that um, the big challenges we've talked about, you know, it's standardizing dosing, it's getting the research done that can allow us to assess uh, the safety as well as the effectiveness in particular use cases. Um, and, you know, what can industry do? Uh, I think that, you know, there really has to be a public-private partnership here. And I'm heartened by what Steph has talked about in terms of this Office of Medical Cannabis setting in, uh, incentives. I've been asked to advise, uh, you know, dozens of companies in the cannabis space, and essentially they're all very interested in doing science until they figure out, usually for me, uh, just how much that's going to cost. And at that point, they say to me, "But, but, doctor, why would we spend, you know?" 20, 50 million dollars to prove this when we can just go to market with it. And I think that that's something that is a real stumbling block on the private side and that we've got to, you know, intelligently craft regulation to incentivize uh, companies to put that kind of money behind the efforts and whether some of that is, is public money, that I think that's fair too. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's the other point of all of this. When we, we talk about the need for these clinical trials, you know, there's not a lot of incentive for patients to participate because they can just purchase the products wherever they want. And to sort of ask them to go into a clinical trial where they may be getting placebo may be really asking a lot. But I also think this idea of having some kinds of public-private partnerships could be important and I think what we need to be, you know, what we need to be um, looking at, and, and you know, I, I do this routinely when I read the research literature, is who are supporting the clinical trials. Because obviously, we start to get into, this is why public-private partnerships may work better, but we start to get into to, um, difficulties when we think that when there is a, when there is a strong financial incentive for, for the um, the, the industry or the group that's conducting the trial. At the same time, we need industry involvement because we don't have the funds federally to be funding all of these clinical trials. So I, um, I, you know, I think we, unfortunately, I think we still have a long way to go. And I think we touched on some of the issues, but there's probably a lot more as well. But I, um, I appreciated my hearing my colleagues thoughts about all of this. You know, I've also enjoyed well, we, this conversation. Oh, sorry. No, I'd say we'll open it up real quick. We've got some time for just real quick final thoughts too from everybody. Yeah, I was, um, I was just gonna follow up uh, with some of my final thoughts, which was um, that it, it was really great conversation, Sarah, Jack, thank you. Um, and, you know, following Jack's question, um, I think that um, what I would like us to see is a public health approach to medical cannabis rather than um, a prescription or even a prohibition approach. Um, many of the state laws were written at first to only allow as few people as possible to participate um, and also you know, regulated the cannabis like it's plutonium. I think actually plutonium has less regulations <clears throat> uh, than cannabis. And, um, and if we look at a public health approach and sort of turn that approach on its head and think about, um, you know, how can we get a safe product um, that isn't addictive to as many pain patients as possible? And if that is the question, 
then that answer is going to include research and public funding and all sorts of things. If we look at um, you know, patients that have inflammation disorders, you know, how can we create a medication uh, where people can take it more than three days without losing their kidneys or stomach over a long period of time? That's an exciting question, right? And I think that if we can look at regulations and look at these challenges as an excitement, right? If, if, if I came up to you today and I said, look, I think I just found this herb that grows with sunlight and a little water, and I think it can do all of these things. Um, I think, and I, and I didn't say the word marijuana, we would, everyone would get out their checkbook and we would be super excited, right? Um, but, you know, unfortunately we've been dealing with this, um, this past of this plant and now, um, now we are where we are. So we also have an excitement in, in the realm of medicine where people are already taking it, um, which doesn't happen in pharmaceutical development. People aren't um, dropping like flies from, from taking it. So I think we need to approach this as a really exciting problem um, that includes uh, private and, and, and public uh, potential funding uh, to solve uh, really what for this nation is a, a you know, a nation in pain um, and uh, many patients that just the, the pharmaceutical industry hasn't come through with a solution uh, for them. So I, I think that that's how we should approach this. Um, not very many people in the regulatory space get as excited as I do, but I think we can change that. Well, Steph, I, I, I really do want to applaud the, the language about public health approach because I think you you kind of hit the, hit the nail on the head about everything that um, each of us is is here to talk about and to better understand too. So um, I want to I want to thank all of you for um, for the contributions today. This has been a really I think insightful and, and great podcast uh, podcast webinar. Um, <laughs> and any I guess I've got a couple minutes for final thoughts here before Jack and I do a, a final wrap here. Well, I would just respond to Steph and say, I first of all, you and I are almost completely on the same page. But I do think it's also worth mentioning that there are in, there are um, instances where the public health model and the medicine model, which is inherently focused on individuals, can become uh, competing. And I think that we have to think a little bit not just about how do we get this stuff to the most people? But how do we get it to an individual in the safest and most um, uh, effective? You know, safety is important, but it's the lowest bar on the on on the totem pole. I'm, I'm sure I'm offending somebody. Um, but you know, there are rungs above that having to do with efficacy, um, and we need to meet those as well. So I think that a public health approach is a good starting point, but we also have to go beyond that um, and really think about what are we providing to an individual where we're not looking at this on a statistical basis, we're looking on it at it um, as how do I take care of this person? And I'm sure you- And I, I, will, I, I will add to that, and I think that that may be another webinar for us is when we start to really understand the in intricacies of the endocannabinoid system too and how that relates to individual health too which is a whole nother topic in and of itself so <laughs> but thank you all jack I'll, I'll throw it to you for some final thoughts here yeah and thank you all for joining us uh the questions that we did not get to um we'll make sure that we push out to the presenters um so that they have those and your contact information and with that uh thank you again for joining us today sarah and i will be taking a short webinar break in august so our next webinar will be on Thursday, September 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be announcing our next guests and topics shortly. And you can catch Sarah on August 11th at 4 p.m. Eastern with Benzinga Live on YouTube. She'll be take, talking to guests from the People's Ecosystem and the Last Prisoner Project about criminal justice reform and the current political environment, Sarah. Well, thanks for the plug, Jack. I appreciate it. Um, and I can't thank each of you enough for joining us today um, and, and thank the audience for having some really insightful, great questions of your own. Um, again, we'll, we'll circulate those with the guests if they have a chance to, to answer them for you. Um, as Jack mentioned, our next webinar together is going to be Thursday, September 29th. Apparently, we get to take a vacation in August, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Enjoy Ireland, Jack. I hear that's where you're headed. 
um, and we'll be announcing our keynote guests shortly. Um, and you can go to www.uscfcr.org slash events for more information and pre-registration for that will open probably in about a week or so. Also, everybody wants to know, a video copy of today's webinar and all of our past webinars are posted on our YouTube site. Um, and you can find the link to that from our own website, which is www.uscfcr.org. So again, the, the, this, this webinar and all of the, the past ones will be on that YouTube site. So again, thank you everyone. And I think Jack's just got a closing reminder for you all. Yeah, we'll see you in September, but until then, um, as you're signing off, if you could complete the short uh, survey, these will get better and better over time. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.